Theo Wisdom Pod uh, with Ben Paul, BD Ladder, Sales Edition. Obviously, Sales Wisdom Pod could be the right fit for that one. Ben, welcome to the pod. Can you tell us a bit more about the BD Ladder and yourself? Sure. Um, thanks for having me, Charles. Um, so I founded the BD Ladder back in 2020. I've got a career that spans sort of two parts. The first part was B2B sales, starting off as we all do, doing the good old cold calling and telesales back in the day. Um, and then moving into more kind of uh, high level account management in that B2B uh, corporate arena, where I was originally from back in London. Uh, I then moved into professional services, helping accountants, grant forms, and it was there, teaching them how to build relationships and do the sales things with their clients. And that saw me come over here to, to Auckland, where the best part was meeting my wife and having a family. But outside of that, was just growing that career and working with other professional services, helping them with their marketing, be business development and strategy plans. And then I kind of got the itch towards the end of 2019 when I was a BD and marketing director at one of the big law firms here. We'd uh, seen Kensington Swan move to combine with Denton's the largest law firm, just going through the process and doing the rebranding stuff, which is really cool from my perspective. But I decided I kind of wanted to be more of an agent of change and help people achieve stuff. So I decided to set up my own consultancy, which has been great fun, which led me to the BD ladder. I and mean, what it will tell you as someone who's a founder and a CEO is I'm not very good at predicting the future because I ended up starting a business slap bang in the middle of lockdown. And it, that was more of a consequence of the time rather than I'd already made those plans. So I wasn't a casualty of COVID, but more just uh, someone who had to adapt quite quickly in that thing. But we've grown from strength to strength. There's now a uh, full-time employee, two associates on board. And we really focus on helping those in the accountancy, legal, engineering, architects, anyone who sells their time by money to to build better relationships with their clients in, the, in that field and develop their skills and they have a long-term relationship that gives them more sustainable pipeline of revenue. And we do that through business development, coaching, training, and some marketing delivery and execution so it's great fun and we really enjoy it you started your career at um grant thornton and pwc two big companies i didn't yeah. even know that these guys had bd people so how did you get these jobs and what were you doing specifically there so yeah i started my professional services career there so i'd been working selling some uh e-learning in london for a company called intellexus and then ilx group and that was that was great fun but um look I wanted to make a change and do something that was a bit more that was quite getting towards quite product focused sales and I wanted to do something a bit more intellectually challenged more service focused so reached out to some recruiters and had a conversation with Grant Thornton and then through the interview process it was really interesting because they wanted someone to come in to sit with their partners and kind of teach them how to sell so in the world of professional services, particularly at that time, there really was only one model, which was business development, enabling those technical people to have better conversations. They're ultimately doing the sales work, but sharing that experience and coaching them along the journey. What they found is they had a lot of really experienced cool BD and marketeers that knew the theory, but hadn't had the experience or the, you know, the actual street fighting side of it where you're actually doing the sales yourself. So when they were getting pushed back, it was really hard for them to to come back. Whereas when a, a senior partner would say, well, when have you ever phoned a C, CFO? I go, well, about four weeks ago. Oh, how did it go? What did you do? It became really real. And we can have a better conversation and really drive the, the adoption further. So yeah, accountants, like any industry need sales. <laughs> Everyone needs to everyone needs to grow their revenue, and it's very very competitive. I mean, you've mentioned two names there, and there's another three ones which are easily roll off the tongue, and there's and there's another couple. So for any business or organization, they've got choices, good choices. Right, and these are I call them boring niches, um, but there's huge money in those niches. Why did you pick those? Is it just because you had experience in there, and the the money's good, or? I generally love working with my clients and the type of people they are. So <clears throat> for them, they're experts in their field. I learn a heck of a lot about business, um, be it lawyers or accountants. When I'm with engineers and architects, I, I learn some amazing stuff about how they design the world and make it a better place. But for them, what they struggle with is that kind of, they've never been taught this stuff. You don't get taught it at law school. You don't get taught it for your accountancy degree. 
they've never been taught how to you know go out there so they get quite far in their career they're technically brilliant and then they get to a point where someone goes right well now you've got to go and generate a book of work and that's really really scary so for me I love the intellectual challenge I also love the challenge of taking someone quite unconfident who thinks they can't do it and move them to a point where they're really really excellent so giving them those simple steps and process and helping them along the way is just so rewarding it's just uplifting Right. And you deal with business owners. So, yeah, that's that's less boring than d- dealing with a, a brown brown Sox accountant. Uh, let's call it that way. What um, do you charge them? What do you do? How many clients do you have? Give me a, a portrait of your business. Oh, look, so any one time across the portfolio will have 10 plus clients running. Um, we charge them differently depending on, on where they're based there's some set programs around around the coaching uh they tend to take three or four from an organization depending on the size of an organization at any one time and it's quite a structured program but it's deliberately consultancy based rather than cookie cutter based so for what we're dealing with here yes there's some metrics around we meet so many times we do all that kind of stuff but there's also a, each individual will have their own individual hangups and problems. So we we start from that point of, of that and then we prescribe and help them through coaching and find the ways that they'll win work. So some people will never pick up the phone. That's fine. They might use emails. They might speak at seminars. They might use LinkedIn for their outreach work. We'll work with that and build that. Their colleague in the office next door might hate the idea of social media with a passion, but will pick up the phone and engage with people that way. So I always talk to them about, we'll get you to that area because it will be dis- uncomfortable because you need to learn in that uncomfortable zone, but I will not push you into panic zone where you want to run away or even worse, hit me. So we'll get to that point where we're we're challenging them and moving them along. Um, and look, we have people who then get into these big organizations who need help on their bid support. So we, we do that on a, and that's one of our associates is focused on that, peers. He works people with their their bids and proposals and drives that forward. Uh, in Australia, Elizabeth is kind of more embedded in clients, so she'll end up working with them on a day to day basis and kind of coaching and driving change from within. And Lucy, who's our employee here, she does actually a lot of that simple execution and marketing for some of those firms that need that extra resource or are struggling to deliver all the stuff they need to do. Because as we know, in that kind of client. Um, mindset of how do you select someone being top of mind in these fields is really really important it gets you in the selection conversation it doesn't win you the work necessarily but it puts you in that conversation to have meet with clients and be be considered so that consideration part she really works on for them in this field right and do you find it hard sometimes just to coach someone that doesn't want to change or is not growing at the rate you want to like and you get impatient sometimes and it's like oh i'm gonna do it for him because i do offer classes i offer coaching and i offer done for you on my side so that yeah they have the three options what do you think about that for us we don't do done for you it's just not in our not in our model and we and we don't think it's right for our particular client base um we believe that from within their organization they're going to have to meet their clients they're going to have to do it so When there's someone that is that unmovable, well, look, we're quite honest at the start. So if we're working with one of our bigger corporate clients, we'll say, look, if we start at eight or 10, you'll give us eight or 10. At some point, one or two months in, I might talk to you and say, look, I'm not going to take any more of your money with this person. They are not going to progress. You know, there's three key parts. You need skills, discipline and motivation to make this happen. Now, unfortunately, you cannot inject someone with motivation. You just can't. And if you could, it would be borderline illegal anyway, whether you can actually do that. So the, the if they can't do that, and yes, we'll try and help them find their, mo- their motivation, but if they won't, then it might be a case of saying, hey, look, you've got all these resources. You've got a brilliant accountant, a brilliant lawyer, a brilliant engineer. They're fantastic. They run a great team. Keep them there and let's work on these other ones. And they'll be the ones that will, will feed the pipeline and do the client relationship work right. You get, so you have slightly more hunters, they used to call it, and slightly more farmers, and let's just build it there. And we'll stop coaching them around this because it's ultimately pointless. We can't get there. We can give them the skills, but if they're not got the motivation to use it, then they won't put the discipline in to do it regularly. 
they'll lose the skills anyway. So yeah, we're we're very we're very mindful of that and very cost conscious for our clients in that sense that we don't want to try and take someone who will never progress. Right. What uh, challenges do you see in law firms that usually you might even think that outreach is illegal? And the the conservatism in them, it's like they always need to be by the letter, by the contract, vs taking risks and sells. Yeah, and look, it, it differs from region to region, right? And a lot of what we talk around is around referral selling, because that's one more comfortable and it's two more effective in this in this market. Certainly here in New Zealand and to a degree in Australia, that there's very small two degrees of separation so actually within a firm and knowing people you shouldn't really ever need to get cold to get an introduction it's actually ridiculously easy here because it's quite a small country and we're quite polite to get a first meeting what people struggle with is the second meeting because they don't do enough on the first meeting to to create the interest or need for a second meeting but we talk about don't leave referrals to chance build build an active referral pipeline right so doing good work and work will come to a degree will happen. But when you start, as we're seeing now, a squiffy market, the market turn, you're leaving it to chance. So in a good market, which lawyers have enjoyed the last three years in most regions, everyone's been growing. But what they haven't been looking at is where are they growing relative to their competition? So what's your market share in the field that you play in? And and has that grown more than your competitors or less? Because if your market share is low, as soon as the market turns, you're going to be in trouble because your costs have risen and you're in that pinch point. And if you're relying on referrals and you don't know how they're coming from or how to farm them, you're even more in trouble. So we talk about active referral programs, how you at the end of a job, you reaffirm that you did a good job, sit with a client and then actively ask them who else within their organization or who within their network they can refer you to. And then we work through a program of when you, you know, you do enough meetings, you have enough, enough time, offer who offer the person in front of you who do you want me to refer you to because more often not they will then instantly come back to you and say i'm not sure or i want a couple of people but who can i refer you to and it starts becoming a a really self-sustaining model so that's really key for them and the, the other thing that's key is you know there's three buckets of who you can talk to clients referrers in this industry so lawyers get referrers from accountants accounts get referrers from lawyers you even get referrers from non-competing law firms and then there's targets actually for most people they can exist in the first two buckets referrers and clients and then it's just having the discipline every week to send those emails in 15 minutes or whatever it might be to build two or three relationship development meetings every week and the more you build will lead to more referrals and more meetings and it's self-sustaining so actually they can do it really easily without having any of these worries but it's just building that structure and that that place and give them the confidence and the tools to do so. Right. You've been through, through the dot-com crash uh, in the 2000s. You've been through yep. the 2007 economic crisis, 2008. Mm -hmm. You started your biz during COVID and now we're in this inflation, infl inflation, inf inflationary uh, environment. Um kind of an economic downturn according to many what insights did you get from all of these uh crashes and what do you see moving forward for your business and your clients businesses look it's fascinating the first thing you you realize is you know don't panic be resilient you can't predict the future and uncertainty will always lead to people doing some strange things in business from time and acting strange as well and look so you, you refer back to you know the first dot-com crash and all that kind of stuff and that's the first time I got made redundant when I was working for a dot-com back in London and it was a really good grounding for me because from that point it you know sort of mid-20s everything been successful kicking goals hitting targets all the time feeling like a superstar and then it was like well and that will happen to everyone at some point in their career. And it's just a case of sitting down and then rebuilding and going, wait, finding the next path and, and, and driving on. And look, every time there's a down, there's an up. And what you learn, particularly with the types of clients I work for, is actually 
it's not necessarily a bad thing to have a downturn. So certain parts of the law and certain parts of the county particularly will do, will, will do really well in an economic downturn. But, and as a business owner for myself, it's it's about when it, when it's good, making sure you're working with the right times, type of clients that's sustainable, that will keep going and making sure that you're aware of where you sit in the market and you're driving it on. And as work, sometimes in a really up market, work just comes through the door. And the danger there is you just take the first thing that comes in rather than the thing that is right for you and your business. And that's what we spend a lot of time talking for about client selection, project selection, matter selection, whatever it might be. And then that helps you be more resilient when the downturn comes. If you find yourself now in a downturn where, where you're struggling, it's like build a plan before you just panic and say, I'm going to go and do some digital marketing or I'm going to go and do this. Take time. What, what I've seen particularly this time, and we're working with a number of clients on this at the moment, is the last three years everyone's been at home and they haven't done the stuff they've done. So the strategy is about four or five years old at best. It's not applicable now. They don't know where it sits. You know, um, I'm a big fan of the plane to win strategy by Lafferty and Martin. Um, and it's clear that people don't know their winning aspiration. They kind of have an idea of the markets they want to play in and, and that, but they don't know what winning looks like for them in their business. So they need to go back to the principles, get a really clear strategy that everyone understands and then start delivering against it. And then that will flow into whether you need marketing support, uh, recruitment, sales training, whatever it might be, but you need to start from that point there. And that's that's one of the fun stuff and things that we do is making sure people are aligned because then growth will happen. So playing to win, yeah. Playing to win, not just playing the game. It's funny, well, yeah. I mean, a lot of the, these books, they just reinvent a concept or rephrase a concept. I'm not saying they are. I think I read the, that book at some point. But yeah, it's, it's basically saying to follow your strategy, to implement it scientifically and observing the results before you give up and move on to, to something else, right? Yeah, and I think one of the key parts is what's your winning aspiration? You know, people, it isn't, you know, the idea of, we just want to be the best lawyers. I mean, that, that untangible, right? The idea, you know, back in back when Apple really, really grew, the idea of, you know, we want to change the world by enabling people through technology. Well, wow, that's kind of cool. You can get along that, right? You know, or as McDonald's say, we want to be known as a, the destination for families with the best customer service, the restaurant they choose to go to in their community, right? You go, well, yeah, and that's, that's how something tangible and you can measure. You know, our families go in there, do they see it as that place, right, kind of stuff, as opposed to we want to sell the most amount of burgers you can ever imagine. So really kind of getting that right then, then goes in and you follow through all the, all the stuff and you know where it is. And, you know, what's good about it is five steps and anything that's, you know, you can write this on a page once you've got it. So if you've got your strategy on a page, you can action it. It's not to say you don't need detailed and massive documents, but for people with an organization to take it forward and then talk about it and carry it forward and drive forward, you need to be able to explain it on a page because that will stick in the human mind. So that's why I think it's really clever about that. Right. Thank you, Ben. It's already over time passed quite quick. Where can people find out more about you? Uh, they can hit me up on LinkedIn if they, they choose to. We have a YouTube channel and all the social media channels and uh, bdladder.com is nice and simple. Uh, that's our website. There's loads of articles and insights and we give away these free tools and free booklets that people can download. Really, really powerful. We, When I founded the business, one thing I wanted to do was to be an education source of information hub. So we have that on our website and we just hope it helps people.